It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrove, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, everybody. And we also have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. So many items in our daily lives rely on petroleum products. Maybe they're actually produced from petrochemicals, like plastic bags or polyester fabric. Or maybe they use fossil fuels to get from their source to our doors. As the global climate crisis deepens, it becomes more and more urgent to wean ourselves off of burning the ancient bones of dinosaurs as soon as possible. While fossil fuel companies were poisoning the planet and getting massive tax breaks to do it, anyone who dared to grow hemp was risking fines or arrest. Outdated laws regarding cannabis, including hemp farming, are finally changing. So in the first half of today's program, we're going to talk to filmmaker Michael Henning and activist Winona LaDuke about hemp and the role it can play in building a zero-carbon economy. In the second half of the show, we'll turn to one of our favorite topics, tax fairness. We know that large corporations will use all resources at their disposal to avoid paying their fair share. They'd rather keep a dozen fancy accountants on retainer to do all their financial contortions than chip in to fill potholes or pay public school teachers a living wage. Our second guest today will be Maryland State Senator Paul Pinsky. He's been working on legislation to close the loopholes that let big corporations off the hook and leave small businesses on Main Street holding the bag. Then if we have time, Ralph will answer some of your listener questions. As always, we'll check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, how can hemp help us transition to a low hydrocarbon diet? David? Michael Henning is a filmmaker and the director of Hempsters, Plant the Seeds, a documentary about the struggle to legalize industrial hemp. Winona LaDuke is an activist, an economist, a hemp farmer, and two-time vice presidential candidate with Ralph Nader. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, where she says she would prefer not to spend her golden years cleaning up the messes of entitled white men. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Michael Henning, and welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Winona LaDuke. Hello, David. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, both of you. Let's start with you, Winona. Most people have to carefully be informed that we're not talking about marijuana. We're talking about industrial hemp, a long fiber product that goes back to ancient China thousands of years ago. And there are thousands of products, consumer and otherwise, over the millenniums that have been made from industrial hemp, clothing and lubricants and food and parts of automobiles. More recently, tons of different kinds of products. It's a plant that doesn't need much pesticides or fungicides, but it has fallen victim to the conflation with marijuana. And our DEA for years put it on the prescribed list where if you planted a seed, just the way Woody Harrelson did in Kentucky a few years ago, you could be prosecuted for a crime. Well, now the Congress, with the support of Republicans, no less, from Kentucky, where the farmers were most vociferous, has now legalized the growing of industrial hemp, subject to a variety of regulations, which Michael Hennies is going to elaborate for us. But you have put seed to sod, and you have now a farm that's growing. It's called Winona's Hemp and Heritage Farm. That's Winona, W-I-N-O-N-A-S-H-E-M-P.com. And so your vision is really spectacular. You want to revolutionize a good part of the world's economy. So can you describe what your vision is, Winona, first, before you also talk about your hands-on farming experience so far with the growing of hemp? Yeah, no, honor to share with you. So I consider this a new green revolution. I mean, you're right, Ralph, in that you know, pretty much anything you can do with fossil fuels, you could do with hemp. And, you know, you could do even a lot more. So, you know, I think about it, the word canvas comes from cannabis. That's kind of an indicator of the potential in the materials economy. Because now we've got all these plastic tarps and, you know, I mean, the clothing industry, the fast clothing that's coming out of H&M and Forever 21. You know, all these guys are like making all this stuff of fossil fuels. And we don't want to do that. 
we want to move along. And so we're looking at building this intertribal hemp cooperative because I live in the Northern Territories and our region, there's a lot of tribes that have been looking at land theft inside their reservations and land appropriation. And they see the potential of building the capacity of this economy. And, you know, they say that about 100 years ago, we had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. It's a really interesting way to put it, a carbohydrate economy or a hydrocarbon economy. We took the wrong choice. You know, so now we've got everything fossil fuels and we're all super addicted and all these plastics and none of this stuff is going away. And so what we need to do is move to an economy that's an organic economy, not a fossil fuel economy. We need to, we need to move away from the dinosaur thing and grow our economy and then sequester a whole bunch of carbon in the process because that's what hemp does. It sequesters carbon. So we have this potential to build what we call the new green revolution. And we're going to do it out of Minnesota because after all the last green revolution, the old green revolution came out of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, Norman Borlaug. So the new green revolution is going to come out of our region too. And it's going to be indigenous and a whole bunch of tribes are interested in growing hemp. And then we got a perfect region for it. And it's a very hardy crop, suitable for the Green Revolution indeed. Canada has been growing it for years. There are a few tens of thousands of acres in Canada. And until recently, we could only import industrial hemp products from China, Canada, Romania, France, and we wouldn't allow the farmers to grow it. Well, now there's been a really great educational expansion of what it's all about and the federal government is slowly adjusting to it, especially the DEA, about which we'll hear more from Michael Henney. So describe your farm and in some agricultural detail, Winona, including the difficulty of getting the right harvesting machinery. So how many acres, where is it, and how you're connecting with the Native American tribes. But let's start with your acreage and your reservation in northern Minnesota. Well, I have about 20 acres in hemp, and we grow fiber hemp. We grow fiber hemp varieties that are basically from France, Italy, and, you know, Northern Europe, the Czech Republic, and Romania. Because those guys, you know, it's kind of, it seems kind of like they kept doing a lot of stuff in the Czech Republic and Romania, kind of like in the Cuba model. Like they just are this older state of industrialization, and they still produce a lot of stuff. And the finest processing is really in Belgium. You know, criminalized in North America. None of that is here. And so we had to go try to figure out, it's like a forensic, you know, it's like a cold case. We know that who killed them and where's the body? You know, it's like who killed the electric car and we know who did that and then where's the body? You know, this is the problem with hemp. We know that hemp was killed by, you know, the lumber barons and the cotton ginny and the oil companies. But the question is where the body go? And so trying to rebuild the renaissance of the hemp economy in this country is like really trying to find a bunch of clues. So look through all this historical stuff and i've been to a lot of conferences and it's like largely full of cannabis growers it's a different species i mean it's kind of like a workhorse or a palomino or something it's different kind of species we're doing different things here and, and also so, you know it, george washington thomas jefferson on their plantations they used hemp they grew hemp the u.s navy made its rope in world war ii from hemp all paper products could be made from hemp instead of the polluting, devastating, dirty paper mills and cutting down all the trees. You know, it's as close to a miracle plant as you can imagine. Even facial applications are being put together now. It's just a remarkable plant. So now you've got 20 acres. There's a farm in Maine that has about 40 acres, and they want to expand to 200 acres. And there's a farm in Maryland that's being criticized by the neighbors for the smell. What's this business with the smell? Well, I don't know if all the varieties smell the same. I haven't done my sniff test. You know, that might be more of the varieties that are more medicinal. I mean, I guess our hemp does smell, you know. I mean, I hadn't really put yeah. stick. I mean, I, you know, I'm an open-air grower. So I don't, I don't really know about that, but I do know that I have eight-foot-tall hemp, and I'm trying to figure out how to process it. So I finally bought a decorticator from China a couple of years ago that you could take to different sites. And then I went to these different facilities and, you know, conferences and people are like, oh, I got this, I got this, there's this miracle happening. None of it was true. None of it's true. The hemp industry in the United States needs a lot of support and development, both in terms of research and capitalization. You know, we're stuck in this spot where 
you know, the technology to build it in this generation in the way that I want to build it too. Because I'm, I'm asking these questions like, they process hemp in China with a whole bunch of chemicals. I can't do that. You know, how do they process hemp in 1930 without a bunch of chemicals? Well, they field redded it, which is what northern Minnesota is perfect for, which means you let it decompose some in the field. And you got to do it really carefully and really mindfully to keep your fiber in good quality. But the stuff that we sent off our field to a processor in North Carolina, very highly regarded. And so they're looking at some renovated, you know, some equipment that, you know, the upscaled from the 40s and 30s and are working to adapt it. But it's really this technological question of how you take something that looks kind of like a thin stalk of bamboo and turn it into a pair of jeans. Yeah, it's a whole learning process. It's a whole part of the agricultural economy. It's going to create all kinds of challenges that have to be but, overcome. Also, Ralph, it's also a question of what's the appropriate size, scale, how do we do this so we don't destroy the planet? Some people are coming into hemp and they're like, well, can I use 2,4-D on it or can I use Roundup? But I was like, no, you know, this is, you don't need that here. I mean, so we want to really push, you know, I'm ready for the next economy and I want to be at the table to help create what that economy looks like because the last economy didn't work for most of us. It worked for a few rich guys, right? So yeah. we want the next economy to be equitable and organic and we want to produce the fiber and we want to mill the fiber. You know, I'm working on trying to get to thread, which I've been working on for five years, seriously. Just focus on getting to thread. And that is like something that is not being done in the United States right now. No one is getting to thread. They're getting to thread in China and to other places. And in Belgium, you know, the, some of the finest canvases are made. That's what we're after. And so, you know, it's going to be some work. We're only going to put in 20 acres this year because, you know, we are still in a pilot stage R&D of using the technology that we are hoping we can bring in and build on the White Earth Reservation. We want to build a set of medium-scale milling facilities on White Earth, on Sisseton. I was at Sisseton Reservation last week. That's a Dakota Reservation. You know, Fort Berthold, Standing Rock. These reservations are really interested in this, and there's plenty of room. You know, if you're going to transform the materials economy, that's a lot of hempcrete instead of concrete. Wow. It's a tremendous conversion. You know, just yeah. elaborate a point you made, that anything – you make from hydrocarbons, namely oil, gas, coal. You can make from carbohydrates, namely plant life, such as industrial hemp. Now, that was noticed in a gathering around 1930, don't hold me to the date, when Alva Edison, Henry Ford, and the president of Harvard got together and said, you know, we have an opportunity here. There's a fork in the road. We can go big with hydrocarbons petrochemical industry, Dow Chemical, DuPont, etc., or we can go the carbohydrate rate. And, of course, we went the hydrocarbon, and the rest is disastrous history, climate disruption, water pollution, air pollution, occupational disease, ravaging of I mean, the lands, and so forth. And so, the other thing is, is that hemp can help make things healing. You know, hemp can help heal things. That's what can happen. And it sucks up carbon because it grows so fast. So say you grow eight feet in 16 weeks or in 12 weeks. Say you grow that fast. That means you're bringing in all that carbon from the air, you know, putting it in the ground, you know. So that's what's so important about it is this plant can help, you know, it grows so quick and it sucks in all of that carbon, you know. And so what we need to do is much faster than a forest. We need to keep our forests intact. You know, and I just want to repeat that, like the boreal forest and the Amazon need to stay intact. And we need to quit cutting them, clear cutting them for, you know, toilet paper. And we need to move to hemp, you know, because and, and, that grows a lot faster. And some years ago, I contacted Patagonia, produces clothing. And the Interface Corporation of Atlanta is the biggest in the world for carpet tile manufacturer. And they said, we'll use hemp. We just can't get it. We'd That's be right. very happy to use hemp. And I know one of the targets of your hemp growing effort, Winona LaDuke, is to change the raw materials for textiles. You want to revolutionize the textile industry. Yeah, I mean, the word cannabis comes from cannabis. You know, and I sit here and I live in northern Minnesota where there are, you know, a million, maybe two million boats. And you know what all those guys have is a plastic tarp that covers them. So I was like, let's just do canvas, you know. If we just did that and we turned all the, you know, and then and then we want, of course, I'm interested in places like packs, you know, industrial uses too. Because it's a great, great material. And then it's only, you know, 70% of the, of the plant is herd. 
Only 15% is fiber and the rest is flour. Why am I telling you this? Because you can produce more than one product out of it. You know, the herd is what you make concrete out of or hempcrete. The herd is what you make bioplastics out of, so you get rid of plastic bags. You know, but also, I mean, the, the fact is, Ralph, that we need to just transform the materials economy. I'm really interested in building a bottle washing factory because why are we crushing all these glass bottles after a single use when, you know, just go a little bit old school or basically the rest of the world and you just rewash a bottle? You know, I'm so sure. you don't want to say that hemp will replace plastic single-use containers. We want to eliminate single-use containers too, right? And we need more innovation. We need more research and development to develop even more uses for this incredible plant. Industrial hemp yeah. has to have less than 0.3% THC. And we're going to get it, Michael Henning into it in a minute on the regulatory aspects of it. But, you know, our listeners, I'm sure, involve people who regularly buy hemp milk. Hemp milk is coming from Canada now. It's sold in stores. They buy hemp seeds. They buy other hemp food products. So that's pretty well known now in a lot of stores around the country. You're inspected by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. That's the first level of regulation. What do they do? You know, so all of my crops have to get tested up. So I got to pass this point three, and I got a clean record. I mean, you know, I've, I don't have a hot crop. But and it's super punitive because let's just be super honest about it. Because if you are growing a plant that comes in at 1% as opposed to 0.3%, it doesn't really matter. They're punishing the plant. I'm just saying, like, who's going to smoke plant that's 0.1% or 1% THC when you could go buy a plant, you know, you could buy some herb at the corner for, you know, 20% THC. So they criminalized the plant and made it really, really hard to produce it under the Trump regulations. And so I'm hoping that Biden will lighten it up a little bit so that a producer like me isn't faced with a bunch of punitive hoops to go through. Now, Minnesota was kind of ahead of the game, and so I'm still under the Minnesota regulations, but we're going to count on the Biden administration to take care of this plant and the potential. I mean, you know, the cannabis economy is a multi-billion dollar economy. And here in Minnesota, I'm looking at a $9 billion pipeline project that no one wants with 23 jobs at the end of it. And I'm like, come on, Governor Walz. Let's legalize cannabis and build a hemp economy. Then you'd have a lot of people, you know? Well, that's underway. And, of course, legalization of marijuana is spreading all over state after state. Uh, listeners should know that Winona and I campaigned in 2000 mm -hmm. and 1996, and part of our campaign was advocating mm -hmm. the legalization of industrial hemp as we went around the country. But there are more problems from the federal government. There's regulatory uncertainty. And we're going to bring in Michael Henning. He's the great educator of the American public about industrial hemp. His 2010 documentary launched a much more aware public. It was called Hempsters Plant the Seed. And he's coming out with a new documentary called Hempsters Reap the Harvest. Michael? Okay. Hello, Winona. Again, nice to meet you. And Ralph and I have known each other for many years and been fighting the same fight. When I met Ralph was in Washington when you were standing up for the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. We just had its first crop raided on the exact same day that Woody Harrelson had his trial, which was kind of interesting. But the great educator, I like that, Ralph. I might use that, <laughs> the great educator. But the point is, is that there's a lot to, to go through here, and I'm going to try to keep it as succinct as possible. Starting off with the DEA, the DEA raided the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation twice. The, the DEA time, stands for what? Sorry, the Drug Enforcement Agency. In and Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah the, the key word being enforcement agency. They're not a treaty abrogation. They don't negotiate treaties, but they took it upon themselves to just say, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, this Controlled Substance Act of 1973 trumps, as they put it, the tribal sovereignty. Does it? <laughs> I can't believe that. Well, I guess we could go into Canada then. But the point is, is that Alex Whiteplume, one of the heroes in this effort, you know, the first time they came out, they didn't make any announcement. They just showed up with guns and scared everybody pretty well. And then they, they took the crop. Now, when, when they eradicate this crop, it's under the auspices of, it's called the Cannabis Federal Eradication Program, which they have an entire page on the DEA's website. You can go read about it. And their plan is to eradicate the plant from the earth, at least from the United States, for starters. Well, when they go out into the field, you'll see it in my film, 
they cut it down with with weed eaters. They're not eradicating anything. The seeds fall to the ground. The roots are still mm-hmm. there. It comes back the next year. They do this all over the country. They do it where it grows wild on the on the roadsides, and it's kind of funny. In the film, uh, Alex comes up to the DEA agents and says, "You know, you guys have gone out of your way to come onto my tribal sovereign land and to cut my crop down, but why don't you go along the roadways in Wisconsin, place where it grows everywhere?" And the, the the agent goes, "Well, Alex, you could tell me where this is. We'll make sure to get out there and do that." He completely missed the point, and it had nothing to do with Alex trying to get hemp eradicated. But his point was well made. But here's what's happening: they're getting a dollar five per plant from our tax dollars by cutting the, down the feral hemp. And I've done the math: you can fit fiber crop like what Winona's growing in an acre. You can have a, a, a million plants. So in essence, they're getting a million dollars per acre. And they're just doing it on the fly. And they're not eradicating anything. They chop it down with weed eaters. It comes back the next year. They're just harvesting and making an incredible amount of money. In the film, you'll see that they wrap it in bundles of 20. And off goes the truck. I'd love to follow the truck sometime and see how they actually do it. But, but when they're done getting their, their money for it, they burn it. So they don't use it for anything, which it could be used for. But it all goes back also to this percentage of THC that has to be, you know, the right. quantity that's allowed. Winona's just scratching the surface there about... Nobody would be remotely interested in buying any or smoking any hemp up to 10% or 15% when in the stores, you know, where people who are actually, you know, regular marijuana users, they're looking for 30%. It's a joke to even to put the pressure on the farmers to grow a crop that would have to be 0.3 is so preposterous. I mean, why don't we start regulating apple farmers for the arsenic and the seeds? It's It's that crazy. And these farmers can see this as a as a great crop that they can, you know, farmers are always looking for something that, that would add to their to their stable. I think it was Thomas Jefferson said, the greatest service that can be rendered in any country is to bring a useful plant to its culture. So here it is, an mm-hmm. old plant that's been around forever, you know. And I really think that the answer is the Native American reservations because they do have sovereignty. All those trees have been ratified and they should just go. I don't see why they even have to adhere to the policy of 0.3. They could say, well, not in our nation, you know? I think that that's one of the things tribes are going to be able to help the industry with is that I do think that we can set a regulatory bar that makes sense, you know, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how this rolls because we just are, 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 you know, getting our breath after the evil Trump era, right? Yeah. uh, You know, and I'm not a Republican and I, I'm not a Democrat. I vote libertarian every year, so don't get me wrong here, but those, those 0.3, Rules were in play way before Trump came along. This comes from laws that were made in France, and it's just, it's it's crazy. I mean, there shouldn't be any regulation. I mean, why would you even bother with it? It's once again, it's arsenic or in apple seeds. So people are too sophisticated now to to think that they would sneak some kind of a marijuana crop into a hemp field. It's crazy. Every time anybody knows anything about it, knows that they cross pollinates. So every time you'd grow a, a yeah. marijuana crop anywhere close to a hemp field. You cut its potency in half every time you harvest it. But so, something, something that Michael, the DEA, was either willfully ignorant of when they kept banning willful. industrial hemp, saying it was a cover for marijuana. Of course, <laughs> the last thing a marijuana grower wants is industrial hemp plants next to it to dilute it. So contemporary, let's, let's ask now, what is Washington doing to help or obstruct the expansion of the industrial hemp economy? Well, back to the uses of the plant. It's the only plant that I know of. Bamboo may be in there, but there are not many that have the quality of food, fiber, fuel, and medicine. You know, what an incredible plant. And in 1937, I don't know exactly, somewhere in the 30s, Popular Science came out with an article, and you can easily find it, and it's called the Billion Dollar Crop. Back then, it should be the Trillion Dollar mm-hmm. Crop now. And, and mm-hmm. it's amazing. There's so much information. I wish I could just do the Vulcan mind warp and <laughs> give it all to you. But let's start with plastic. Hemp plastic is biodegradable. It, it will melt in the ocean or it'll, it'll disintegrate in, in anywhere you bury it. So the plastic problem is solved. The big plastic problem of the, the island out there that's floating around, that's ancient history if they want it to be. Let's go back to what Washington is doing now. Yeah. That, that's where you can really bring us up to date, Michael. What they're doing is they're, they're making the regulations so stiff that I know of Texas farmers here in Texas that had a 180 acres. And they were zero, zero, imagine a wine that's zero point anything. It's not even wine, but it was 0.5. The crop is, you know, 0.3 THC is the cutoff. 
they showed no mercy. They just said, well, sorry, the hot crop, yeah. you got to burn it. They had to burn 180 acres. It, it's enough to make the farmer go, you know what, this is not too much trouble for me. But they're still willing to give it another round, and, and they have literally millions of acres of grow land that they could grow it in, but they have to have buyers for it. And the Texas farmers I know a little bit more about because I live here, but Washington is in a position where they should just blow the doors open and allow these farmers to grow as much as they can. What are you saying, Michael? The old guard is still in charge of the DEA? The DEA is still eradicating the feral hemp, which that's got to be illegal because the crop's legal to grow. So what are they doing on Texas roadsides next to these farmers harvesting hemp and we're paying for it? How, how can that be? I mean, that's got to be illegal. Is there anything going on in Congress to straighten out the DEA? Anything going on in the White House? I mean, even Senator McConnell has come around and supported industrial hemp because all the heat he was getting from Kentucky farmers. What's well, the situation? Whatever, whatever's going on, it's not much in terms of freeing up the farmers to grow it. Because I know that the farmers that I know are working really hard. The Kentucky Hemp Coalition, Joe Hickey and those guys, they're trying really hard to just get them to allow 1%. You know, what I want to do, Ralph, and this is something I'm, I'm glad I just remembered this. I want to organize or have you show us how to do the citizen summons. If people only knew about that unifying factor that we could summons our senators and congressmen back to our home state and tell them what to do, it would rejuvenate the whole system because never before have we had the ability to communicate like with the Internet. So you said get a thousand signatures and you'll be carrying a big bat. Well, you can get a thousand signatures in a day. There's an app called next door. Most well, people know about it. Tell Invest. us about your new documentary and how we can access it. Hempsters okay. plant the seed. No, it's, that's the first one. The second one's called Reap the Harvest. And the first one's been released and it's done really, really well. So it's got a lot of good, great ratings and everything. But I wasn't even going to do a second one until I heard that the DEA is still doing this tactic of harvesting wild hemp. And what we could do, what I think would be the ultimate thing to do, since you asked, Everybody that hears this radio broadcast, call Farm Aid and say, why don't you make industrial hemp the focus this year? If they can't do it this year, mm -hmm. next year. That's a national organization that Willie Nelson's helped right. start right. of progressive farmers. So pro-farmer. I mean, they really help the farmer. If you call them up, they're, they're into the family farm and they're fighting against the corporate farms. But if it was the focus this year, they could really help these farmers understand how to do it and the regulations and all that could be dealt with. There should be a citizen summons kind of uprising in terms of telling these congressmen that they need to stop regulating this fantastic new crop, food, fiber, fuel, medicine. Why can't they just open this up and let farmers do what they can do? The, I know that the Texas farmers just have, they're in their second year and they grew so much hemp so fast because they're used to growing cotton and other things. It was amazing, but they need to have buyers. Well, here's the, here's the latest thing with, with that. Why I don't understand why Washington's even not just letting this happen, but it could be feedstock for the making of hydrogen. Now, hemp is carbon neutral. It sucks in enough carbon to where if you burn it, it's equal. So that's one thing. But with these new plants that they're developing, they have a thing called carbon capture anyway. So farmers could grow as much hemp as they could possibly grow and it wouldn't be enough to supply these manufacturers of hydrogen as a fuel stock for these microgrids. Are there any corporate vested interests against hemp? In the old days, it would be the paper industry, but I understand they've come around. Is the DEA a problem because it's being hammered by vested interests from the world of hydrocarbons? Yes, and I think it's just in inherent. But what we, I think what we, we need to do is show the benefit to the petroleum industries rather than trying to outmaneuver them. Because if they see how they can make money, you'll win them over a lot faster and they'll start going in that direction. A lot of this would be taken care of if people only knew. You know, if they just knew that the just the fuel alone, they could make so much fuel from this. I forget the tonnage that it comes out to, but we could supply all the fuel we need from growing hemp, by the way, including diesel from the seed oil. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. And hey, Michael... I'm not for corporations taking over this crop. You know what they do with things like that. We want this <laughs> to be a people's crop. And Winona, you know that the Biden plan for stimulating and relieving the economy in a COVID period, the multi-trillion dollar plan, includes $31 billion for the First Nations, the Native American tribes. Do you think part of that will go to 
expanding the hemp economy on Indian reservations? Have you heard anything? You know, I think that a lot of tribes are looking at how to stabilize tribes. And, you know, there's the COVID pandemic, but, you know, what we saw with Florida, what we see with Florida infrastructure, you know, the crisis in Texas over energy. I mean, our tribes are like in really perilous situations. And so a lot of our tribes, I think, are kind of like shoring up their local food systems, looking at some of their energy systems. And yes, some of them are looking at the just transition work. But, you know, and we're going to do a bunch of organizing in our region. A lot of tribes have had, you know, dog and pony, snake oil salesmen sweep through about 70 times, you know, and, you know, like the tribe should do this. You guys can make some money. You're sovereign. And so tribes are not in a position to do, enter into a lot of like uncharted territory. The tribal farmers are in a little better situation. And so we're going to work on growing the plant. And then when things emerge more, I think that we'll be more definitely we'll be more on the front page of, you know, how the hemp economy is for tribes. Well, the tribes um, have but, really got to take control of the, how this $31 billion is going to be yeah, used. Yeah, the $31 billion is is a different question than the hemp, but it's a fair question. Yeah, we definitely have to take some responsibility and, and work on that. I know a lot of tribes are having some pretty good, you know, plans. So I've been proud, you know, I've been I've been relieved with that. Yeah, because so, they do know, want we'll to see. build better we'll roads. I'm deeply and... concerned of, of how much, this is more money than we're going to see in a long time. That's yep. right. I know the Biden administration wants to build a lot better roads on Indian reservations, but we want a lot growing between these roads as you are pioneering. Right. We're nearing right. the end of our time. Steve, David, you want to pitch in here? I'm sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I guess you kind of touched on it. We did a show a couple of years ago when, maybe it was even last year, when the law changed under the Trump administration about industrial hemp. And how has Wall Street responded to this? Is there investment? Is there, you yes. I would think you want to get on the ground floor of this. Yes, there is investment. It's, it's coming from... What's the name of the group? The Motley Fools, I think they're called. They advise people. And they yeah. they were just the other day touting that they have these incredible hemp companies that they want to refer to for buying their stock. You know, it's just getting started. But it should be known that this whole thing took place years ago, what we were talking about earlier, 1937 back then when they did this. My friend Gatewood Galbraith, who's passed away, he's in the film. He said it was called the synthetic subversion. The whole idea of having the rural areas supply themselves with everything they need was in motion. And the opposite of that is to crowd people into cities, condense them and get them working in factories and all that control effort. We need to go back to that. The agrarian society, like when I was talking about, you know, the founding fathers, that's what they saw, you know, working in the fields in the day and reading Shakespeare at night was kind of a vision that I heard that was their vision of the future. But we can seize about, the can moment. Can we replace the... Go ahead, Do we Arnona? replace the founding fathers with the sustaining mothers? Absolutely. Matriarchal society would be a much better set up for <laughs> like, the entire planet. <laughs> Enough of the pioneers and the founding fathers, you guys. Can we, like, yeah. ditch that and move on to the – who's going to make the sustainable economy? That would be the people who Absolutely. have to make sure the people are fed, right? That would be, that'd be a, right. Matriarchal society yeah, would be awesome, and I know that the Lakota do it that way, and – and I, I've, I've really appreciated learning about that. It would there, there would be no wars. I don't think the moms of the world would be so engaged in battle. You're right. You're dead on. And I just want to see it get to where, where we should just be kicking the doors down. And I think the way to do it is citizen summons. And, and Ralph talks about that in his, a lot of his books. I know Unstoppable is a great book that talks about it. We could just find, instead of being the divided states of America, we could unite on these points if people just knew. And so many people don't know. People don't know that like Woody Harrelson was acquitted by jury nullification. If you go into a courtroom and you say the word jury nullification, they sent you out of there with all anybody that's in the hearing distance. Jury nullification, citizen summons, all these kind of things could be done. Well, if there are listeners who want to have living room gatherings to learn more about industrial hemp, they can easily access your documentaries. Tell them how. <laughs> well, uh, it's on our, our, you can get it on our website, which is hempstersthemovie.com. I'm a speaker at some of these events, so I'd be glad to go there if needed. We also have, we're starting an, an initiative now on a new website called Action Hemp, so people can find out .org. We're going to start that. We've already got it up and running, and that's the point. Is with the internet, we can we the people can become a reality if we just know which elements to put together. And citizen summons, I really want a quick tutorial okay. from you, Ralph, on how, how we can start doing that nationally. 
it's all going to start at the grassroots because all these products are going to end up in stores all over America. People can get them in a whole variety of ways. And as I say, they're already buying food products. Tell our listeners, Michael, before we close, sure. exactly what Woody Harrelson did because he, he yeah, did it a, deliberately. He went to Kentucky, and what did he do? And then well, he was arrested. Well, it's a federal crime to plant five seeds. So he planted four seeds of feral hemp in Beattyville, Kentucky, called Joe Hickey, his friend who helped put it all together, called and said, we would like to report a crime in progress. And the sheriff came out and he, on camera, planted the seeds in front of the sheriff and they arrested him. Well, four years later, it went to trial. Thank God. Had they just blown him off, this would have never been, the point would have never been made. But he was trying to prove that there's a difference between industrial hemp and smokable marijuana. And he was guilty as he could possibly be. He was on camera. He said he knew he was breaking the law. He says, hard job breaking the law. The jury knew it, and they came out, and they said, not guilty. That's jury nullification, and it changed everything because now people can say, well, because of that, it, it builds up case law, as you know. If there's enough case law, it starts to become the law. And so that was really bold of Woody to do that. And, A lot of and, people think, and the message of public opinion in Kentucky was not lost on Mitch McConnell in the U.S. Senate. I can, ver- I can verify for that. And that's what led to that bipartisan effort to legalize industrial hemp a few years ago as part of a larger agricultural bill. Anyway, we're out of time. Is anything else you want to leave us with, Winona, before we close? Make sure you keep an eye on what's going on up here in northern Minnesota. Epic battle for the single largest tar sands pipeline in the world. They're trying to put in and Starting in June, tens of thousands of people will be here. But all we really want is a just transition to the hemp economy. You've already stopped a couple of pipelines, so this isn't a pipe dream to stop this one, which isn't even needed, as you've documented repeatedly in your demonstrations and public statements. How yeah, can people reach? Yeah, jobs how, is not an economy. Right. How you can know? people Let's, reach you, Winona? Honorearth.org. H-O-N-O-R-E-A-R-T-H dot org. You know, if, info at honorearth.org or, you know, you can find us and then keep keep an eye on it. But, you know, we have to fight these guys and it's dumb. You know, what we want is a good economy that brings life and not death. And if you're lucky like I am and get the mailings from Honor the Earth, they're beautifully done artistically, thanks to Winona and her colleagues. And also they're beautifully authentic. And that's why I support Honor the Earth, and I hope some of the listeners will do the same. Thank you, Winona LaDuke. Thank you, documentary maker, the great educator on industrial (laughs) hemp, Michael Henning. And we look forward to more progress in Washington. (laughs) Obviously, this is going to be continued. It's a transformation of a good part of the world economy, going carbohydrate and displacing hydrocarbons, the future of the planet is at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. We've been speaking with Winona LaDuke and Michael Henning. We will link to their work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Let's take a quick break. When we return, we're going to talk to Maryland State Senator Paul Pinsky about making corporations pay their fair share in taxes. But right now, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, May 28, 2021. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Name the top three killers of Americans. Number one, heart disease. Number two, cancer. And number three, 400,000 people die every year from medical malpractice, avoidable injury, or infection caused by medical providers. Now a new book from Oxford University Press, Closing Death's Door, takes a deep dive into the problem of medical malpractice. I had been aware of issues of medical error, medical litigation, insurance costs, and law reform for decades, said co-author Michael Sachs. The focus was rarely on the big problem, hundreds of thousands of dead and injured patients. The debate was almost always about taming litigation so it would not be annoying to healthcare providers. All the while, little was being done to improve patient safety. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. Let's fill some corporate tax loopholes, shall we, David? Paul Pinsky represents Prince George's County in the Maryland Senate, where he has introduced the Corporate Tax Fairness Act of 2021. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Senator Paul Pinsky. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. 
Senator Pinsky, we have had prior programs on corporations evading and avoiding federal taxes. And all the big corporations, I think the latest study showed about 55 giant corporations making $77 billion in one year, and they paid not a cent in federal income tax. We're going to talk now about how they do the same thing at the state level. And I think our listeners will be even more interested to see how the state revenues are being depleted and not applied to their community public services and infrastructure because these corporations are escaping their taxes. Now, you have a bill in the Maryland legislature. You've had it for several years, and it's gaining increasing support, and we'll run by that issue in, in a moment. Describe the what you call the two major loopholes in our corporate tax system in Maryland, and then tell us how many states are doing it right and how many aren't. Thank you, Ralph. What happens is a parent company will create subsidiaries, but they'll have the subsidiaries in low-tax states. So then if a company in our state of Maryland is actually buying services or goods from one of the other subsidiaries in a low or no-tax state, they write it off. So while the parent company is making millions and millions of dollars, uh, in terms of their taxable income, their expenses, some of these will show zero on their tally sheet when it comes to working out corporate income tax for the state of Maryland. And I believe about a 25 to 30% of our largest corporations in Maryland paid zero taxes. I mean, zero taxes. We're losing between 100 and $125 million each year. Name some of these largest corporations that are doing this. They're They're basically playing the game they play internationally. They make a lot of profits in Maryland, and then they build up the expenses so that they don't show any profits and take advantage of low tax states like, say, Nevada or Florida. Delaware. Yeah, yeah Delaware, of course, right nearby. Yeah. Uh, Ralph, what, what are the names of some of these companies? Well, Ralph, you're exactly right. I mean, it is like what's happening on an international scale. Unfortunately, the tax information is proprietary, meaning it's not for public notification. When you do your taxes, they can't be shared. So, you know, over the years, we've gotten a list of the top 25 largest corporations and the next 25. And what we've seen of the top 150 for-profit corporations, about 50 of them, a third, don't pay taxes. So we can't pinpoint exactly, but, you know, we have a number of companies actually situated in Maryland. Marriott, we used to have Discovery. They actually moved to New York, which is a combined reporting state. We have Lockheed Martin. And of course, we have the city banks of the world, the CVS and Walgreens of the world. So it's really the multi-state, multinational corporations. Yeah. This that is have pretty, the, you know, this is pretty extraordinary. What possible argument could there be to make public giant corporations tax returns secret under state law? I don't know if you know, but until the 1960s in Wisconsin, you could go to the Wisconsin Department of Revenue and look at all the corporate income taxes. They were completely public. And then the lobbyists went to work. So are you pressing to make public these corporate tax returns? Well, first, I'd like to get the tax on the books. And, and again, I think Exhibit A is Donald Trump. And why do they have this? So they can hide their machinations and how they skirt the law. If it was public, I think it'd be a greater outcry. And unfortunately, there's not a large outcry or they're not as large as it should be because ultimately it falls on working and middle income families to pay the tax burden while all these corporations and one tenth of one percenters are getting away scot free. I mean, even Warren Buffett acknowledges it. Well, definitely. You know that 20 other states in the District of Columbia do it right. That is, they don't allow these kinds of loopholes that Maryland is being subjected to. What are some of those states? Well, actually, uh, Ralph, I think we're close to 29 states. The irony of it all is half the states are Republican states. I mean, the Idaho's, Kansas, Kentucky, Montana's, Texas, Utah, as well as, of course, California, New York, Michigan, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and the list goes on. And no one has reversed it. So when I go in front of the Budget and Tax Committee, when I testify on behalf of the bill, I say it doesn't matter if it's a big state, small state, red state, blue state. They've all passed this. And it's ironic that a fairly blue state, occasionally purple, in Maryland, we can't pass it. And I said, it's like putting your head in the sand. We're going to be the last one standing. We'll be the laughing stock. And we're a democratically controlled legislature. So 
it's unfortunately some of my colleague Democrats who are the ones who are blocking this. Well, before we get to that, what's the number of your bill? I know the legislature is out of session now for the year, so you, you can't get any action until next year. You did pass it in one house, I understand, but what was the, what was the, the number the, of the bill? The bill number was Senate Bill 511. It'll have a new number next year. We have to resubmit bills each year. Ralph, it also deals with what's called the throwback rule or no income rule. You know, uh, products or services that are uh, created in our state and then sold to a state that has no tax, they're not getting taxed. So a number of states have passed what's called a throwback, which means the tax revenue would fall back to the originating state. And and that would bring in another 40 or $50 million. And it's just, you know, how they skirt the tax law. They, of course, have floors and floors of CPAs and attorneys, and all they do is figure out a way to go around federal and state tax law. Well, let's go through a list of potential supporters and see whether they are backing out or whether they're supporting. Is your bill supported by Governor Hogan, Republican? No, not at okay. all. Is he opposed to it actively? Well, he didn't have to worry too too much because the Chamber of Commerce did all, all the heavy lifting. I think they testified against it in the hearing this past winter. How about the Democratic delegation in Congress from Maryland? They generally haven't weighed in on local bills. I know there are a number who've supported in the past. Uh, Jamie Raskin, when he was in the Maryland State Senate with a co-sponsor, I think now Senator Chris Van Hollen had been a supporter when he was in the Maryland legislature. Okay. But I don't have recent letters from them. Okay. How about the Maryland tax collector? No. Interestingly enough, the comptroller, who is now running for governor, he many, many years ago supported it, but he has joined forces with the corporations and the bankers to uh, oppose it. How about Explicitly. the trade unions in Maryland? They supported it by and large. Unfortunately, we have not built the kind of grassroots coalition that's very visible and loud. And, you know, everyone says, sure, we agree with it, but it hasn't gotten the momentum that we need to the point where legislators would see they have no other choice but to support it. Did you have many co-sponsors in the state Senate in Annapolis? Well, we have uh, 47 senators in these 24 to pass the bill, and we have actually 32 Democrats. Over the years, I think this year, because of the COVID, we were limited in getting co-sponsorships. I had eight or nine, but we've had as many as 18 or 19 over the years. You've and, got a problem with your Democrats, some of them. Yes, absolutely true. And, and look, some of these corporations will pick up a phone and say, look, if you pass this, we'll leave. It's, it's the traditional economic blackmail. And of course, they're not going to leave. Corporations don't move because of tax policy. They decide based on infrastructure, on having roads to deliver their product, schools, and other infrastructure. So, you know, that's been used around the country for decades and generations. You know, we're going to take away jobs if you don't give us this tax break. We're talking with state senator in Maryland, Paul G. Pinsky, who's the chief sponsor of the Corporate Tax Fairness Act of 2021. He's also the chair of the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee, and he represents Prince George's County in the Maryland Senate. Let's talk about the media you're getting, Baltimore Sun, NPR, PBS, commercial radio, TV stations, other newspapers. What kind? Well, you know, first one in the D.C. media market, which you're familiar with, Ralph, Maryland is fighting the federal government coverage, Northern Virginia, D.C., and the local jurisdictions, which are fairly significant, Montgomery and Prince George's. So the Post doesn't spend a lot of time on Maryland state politics. The Baltimore Sun has been good, I think, over the years. At various times, they have endorsed it in their editorials. So, you know, we'll get a line here or there. But each year, it seems that people aren't infuriated and other bills move to the front of the line in terms of coverage and visibility. Are you so, working with any citizen groups, especially, it's really a good one in Washington with connections throughout the states of the U.S. It's called Good Jobs First. It's run yeah. by its founder, Greg Leroy. Has he been helpful to you? Yeah, look, I've known Greg and we've communicated for many years on this and other progressive taxation policies. Oh, good. You know, there are a number of grassroots groups that have supported us. We've had great hearings. Look, the facts are on our side. Unfortunately, we have not 
gotten enough Democrats to realize that this revenue could be used for public education. We, we just passed a major transformation called the Kerwin Proposal, a blueprint for Maryland's future. It's a $4 billion, really radical change how we can fund and, and have our schools be world class. We need revenue for that. And here's a clear, obvious answer. You know, all the employers, they say, and all these big corporations, we want people who are employable, who are trained and well-educated. Well, they need to step up to the plate. It's all the more reason we should close these type of loopholes. Yeah, you, you know, once uh, during the savings and loan crisis, the, there was a hearing in Annapolis, and we were part of a rally around the legislature. And Ben Cardin was a state legislature then. Two questions. Does Senator Ben Cardin support this bill of yours? And second, what about a big rally next year when the legislature comes into session? Look, I don't remember talking to Ben on this bill. You know, in, in the course of our 90-day session, which is an annual, we have 2,000 bills come in. Look, I think this is very important. I've also introduced bills on sweeping bills on climate change. We've been dealing with police accountability. So sadly, some bills get sort of shunted to the side. So I, I haven't talked to Ben about it. Over the years, we've had rallies. During that 90-day session, you know, many interest groups hold a rally on a Monday night when there's a, a show session on the Monday evening. But we, we will look forward to doing increased mobilization. And hopefully, if the Biden administration move ahead with some of their tax changes, it'll give us some momentum and some wind or backs. But, you know, there are other issues. I've also tried to address the carried interest legislation on that, making our personal income tax more progressive. You know, we should be leading the nation, not just middle of the pack. You know, some states have been bold. Some cities and counties have been bold. We have to be much bolder. Well, you know, listeners might need to be aware that a lot of the loopholes in the federal tax code are copied in the state tax code. Like State Senator Pinsky just said, the carried interest, that's the racket where these investment advisors say that their fees from their advice to private equity firms, et cetera, are treated as capital gains when every accountant in the country laughs at that. So are you kidding? This is ordinary income. Just like real estate agent gets a commission from selling a house, the real estate agent pays ordinary income. They don't pay lower capital gains. That's costing the federal government, by the way, Paul, $180 billion over 10 years. So you can imagine what it's costing your state around the country as well as the state of Maryland, which is the subject of our interview today. I introduced it because I think states should begin to take action. We shouldn't wait for the federal government. I, I, I'm not optimistic we're going to overturn the filibuster. So, I, you know, we would be the first state in the country to pass carried interest. And I think every state across the nation should be raising this issue and not letting these hedge fund managers take other people's investments and consider it capital gains rather than personal income tax. Well said. And your biggest champion is the great investor Warren Buffett, who thinks it's one of the great absurdities of the federal tax code loophole. So anyway, we're just about out of time. Any pressing questions to Steve and David? Do you have local corporations doing business with the state of Maryland? And couldn't you then mandate that no contracts would be awarded unless they paid their fair share of taxes on those contracts? Well, most of the local businesses that might be doing business, most local are small and they're not multi-state or multinational. And it's really those larger corporations that use these benefits that set up subsidiaries in other states. Um, no, no, David is saying if the large corporations right. do local business. Right. No, I, I think that's true. And yes, just as we did clawback and we've worked on other strategies with Greg Leroy, actually, I think that is a, another avenue we could pursue. But I'd like to capture all of them. I mean, these are outrageous loss of revenue and it gets dumped on working middle income families to pick up the difference. And it's it's you know, it's upside down. It's it's Alice in Wonderland. Well, since you have a Democratic legislature and you're getting more and more Democrats, you're almost over the top. And I think if Governor Larry Hogan, who has presidential aspirations, realizes how popular this is and how it's already in 29 states in the District of Columbia, uh, I think you're on the verge of success here. So good well, luck to you. I hope so. And thank you very much, Ralph. You're welcome. We've been speaking to Maryland State Senator Paul Pinsky. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Let's do some listener questions. Our first question comes from Adila Mustafa. It says, hi, Ralph. 
big fan of you, David and Steve. We have a big fan out there, David. What do you know? He asked, what is your opinion on Pfizer making demands from governments around the world for indemnity in lawsuits on the side effects of the vaccine? So far, the Indian government has not agreed to this, but I think Pfizer is justified in making this demand since this vaccine is a special case and developed in a highly urgent circumstances. If a big number of people go for lawsuits citing minor side effects, won't Pfizer go bankrupt? Thanks, Adil. Not at all. They're well insured. No drug company has been driven bankrupt in the past. New or old vaccines by tort lawsuits. And you don't want to get a drug from a company that was developed under the belief that if someone dies because the drug is contaminated, like batches of some drug on COVID were in a factory in Maryland, caused a death or serious injury, and you couldn't sue. I suppose what Adil doesn't know, and most people don't know, is that Pfizer and the drug companies are already protected under federal law from product liability suits. There's a a fund that is similar to a worker's compensation fund. So if someone's seriously injured or next of kin, they can collect a modest amount, not enough to deter the drug companies. The basic point is the drug companies should have maximum interest in not being negligent, not rushing to beat the competition, especially since they are so heavily subsidized by the U.S. government. Billions of dollars have gone to Moderna and others. Thank you for your questions. I want to thank our guests again, Michael Henning, Winona LaDuke, and Senator Paul Pinsky. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of the show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we'll welcome... Gero Lejeune, author of Honor of Thy Label, Dr. Bronner's Unconventional Journey to a Clean, Green, and Ethical Supply Chain. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Try to get us more stations, listeners. Hi, this is Jimmy Leeward, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up where Ralph answers more of your listener questions. This next question comes to us from Don Harris. Your recent article on the demise of NPR from its original mission was well done. The flaw with the idea was it was created by government action and controlled by government. As the government became controlled by corporations, NPR suffered the same fate. The solution is a media conglomerate that is controlled by ordinary citizens to provide information that ordinary citizens want and need. A nonprofit corporation can be set up selling shares for $100 to buy up startup radio, TV, internet, newspapers, etc., to form this media conglomerate overseen by a board with people like you on it. These shares can only be owned by American citizens, and no person can own more than 10 shares. The shares can only be sold for $100, as the purpose of owning the shares is to control the media and not make money off the price of the shares. Just 10% of the 150 million 2020 voters investing just $100 would total $1.5 billion. Don, your proposal reminds me of a proposal we issued years ago called Audience Network. It was a nonprofit. It would be paid for by the audience in a structured way with local, regional, and national radio and TV shows and it would be free of advertising pressure and other bureaucratic restraints. We had a full House of Representatives committee hearing on that, chaired by now Senator Edward Markey when he was a congressman. And on one side of the table were the corporate media people who were attacking the idea, the people who have the broadcast TV and radio stations commercially. On the other side was me and a couple conservatives, genuine conservatives, who wanted a media for of by the people. And of course, it never went anywhere because the local 
TV and radio broadcasters pounced on the members of Congress and said, don't you consider that anymore. You can get the proposal by going to nader.org and, and follow it up with the phrase audience network. So keep thinking about it, talking it up. People got to realize they own the public airways and they should have reasonable control over some part of the 24 hours a day when people are likely to be listening and viewing this media. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. I know you're a longtime listener. This next one is not so much a question as a comment, and it's from uh, someone named Eric Peterson responding to our interview with John Koskinen, former commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. He says, excellent interview about Internal Revenue Service. However, it did not go far enough. He's a retired revenue officer. Some years ago, there was a Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration report which claimed that we were spending too much time on cases. So IRS management changed policy to close cases, close cases mentality. The idea was to close a case as quickly as possible and don't sweat the details. I had a case where the individual had two sources of income, both over $6,500 a month. I was told to close that case, quote, hardship, even though I was finding undisclosed assets. Since I kept doing the job I was trained to do, they tried to fire me 110 days before my retirement date. There are also policies which encourage corrupt behaviors by managers who are trying to get bonuses and promotions based on statistics. All Koskinen said about the lack of support for the agency was true, but there are far more issues than what he said. So kind of an insider's view there, Ralph. Definitely. And you make the good point. You know, we did focus on the inadequate budget of the IRS, driven since 2011 by the Republicans in Congress who knew what they were doing in aiding and abetting tax evasion by the super rich and the big corporations, you opened up a whole another area that has occasionally been probed by some newspapers. But the politicization of the Treasury Department and the IRS has had a very, very sordid history, so to speak. You remember Nixon wanted to use the IRS to punish his enemies during the Watergate scandal. So thanks for bringing this up. And that's a wrap. Join us next week when we speak to Gary Lazan from the Dr. Browner Soap Company about his book, Honor Thy Label, and also 16-year-old activist Kayla Walsh about the youth organizing she did that helped get Ed Markley reelected in Massachusetts. Until next time. Stand up.